My next guest for the evening, ladies and gentlemen, is somebody who's going to be talking about her journey from media to film production. Supriya Menon started out as a rookie journalist at NDTV in Mumbai and then moved on to BBC as their India business correspondent. After an illustrious career in journalism, she moved to cinema and kick-started her production journey as a co-founder of Prithvi Raj Productions in 2017. In an ever-changing world and media environment, she well, is very well placed to mount both theatrical and OTT films and series. Collaborating with Sony Pictures International, she produced some game-changing sci-fi movies, Nine, in Malayalam. She's followed this up with Driving License, a huge commercial success, now being remade in other languages. Her production, Kuruti, has received pan-Indian praise for handling a sensitive topic beautifully and with ease, just like herself. Then she embarked on Janaganamana, a raging commercial success and politically relevant thriller. Her last release was Kadua at the box office blockbuster. In Malayalam, she's currently awaiting the release of, a, of Gold, starring Prithviraj and Nayantara. On the production front, Supriya is finishing her first Hindi film, Selfie, starring Akshay Kumar and co-produced by Karan Johar. Personally, thank you, yes, really. Personally, I add, obviously she has reached all of this and achieved so much because she's extremely prompt, loyal, and reliable. Ladies and gentlemen, Supriya Menon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see very few gentlemen, which is a pleasant surprise, I must add. I'm, uh, yeah, there are a few of you here, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about my journey clearly. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Anjali. Um, thank you very much. I've always wanted to change the world. I started out by believing I could do so even when I was a small kid. So I thought I'd start by a career in civil services. But when I grew closer to college, I kind of realized that for an assertive and rather rebellious young woman like me, that may not be the best fit. It was then that I thought of moving to the world of media. And um, I, can, I do have the gift of the gab, as you can see, and could confidently put out my thoughts and ideas to people. So naturally, journalism was the next best choice. Um, I pursued my graduation in political science honors, followed by a master's in journalism specializing in broadcast journalism. At that time, there weren't very many role models, but Dr. Pranoy Roy was the pioneer, and Barkhadat, of course, was the female representative of everything that I aspired to be. I remember, I might kind of sound a bit ancient with this admission, and I don't know how many of you remember this, but The World This Week, presented by Dr. Roy and Appen Menon, was one of the programs that I grew up watching, and I was absolutely blown away by what they were doing. <clears throat> I was very young then, of course, I must add that. Um, so after that, um, I'm just going to look at my notes. Um, in those days, private news channels were just beginning to show their new prowess, and I was amazed at the power and might of the visual medium. It had the power to move minds and change hearts. At that point in time, uh, you know, they weren't... Uh, I remember India was just beginning to see its stories being lived out on the big screen and every night at 9 p.m. people gathered around their television sets to watch the most important news stories of the day. Now blazing a trail of its own amidst all the clutter of all the news channels that were there was New Delhi television, NDTV. That was my holy grail. That was where I wanted to be. But um, I didn't know how to get in. No one in my family had ever been a journalist or had anything to do with the profession. My father was not a bureaucrat, neither was he a big industrialist. And I certainly did not have a famous last name. Um, so I was just a young girl with, uh, young middle class girl with uh, big dreams and lofty ambitions. After working for a few months in a tabloid, I had the opportunity to be interviewed by NDTV um, just ahead of the general elections. I got the job of a reporter. I remember the moment when I walked out of the interview room after talking to Rajdeep Sardesai, Mrs. Roy, and a few others, which was done by a camera. I knew I'd got it. It was the start of living my dream. At NDTV, I got to know Bombay inside out. Now, as they say, Mumbai is a city, but Bombay is an emotion. I mean, I'm sure you can you know, attribute to that. Um, and for me, it's a city that's taught me everything, a place that I call home, a place that taught me to dream big, uh, to hustle. I covered all kinds of stories as a cub reporter. I remember covering horrific crime stories that made me question humanity. I also reported on the daily humdrum of the city, its, um, 
you know, real estate, the mill lands, the real estate crunch it faced. So much so that my constant reporting led the High Court to pick up a case, so motto, on the conversion of mill lands to malls. For me, it was a high point in my career. I felt I was really making a difference in the lives and minds of people, which is what I'd set out to do uh, with my journalism initially as well. I also reported on the closure of dance bars extensively. Uh, at that point in time, um, you know, night after night, I went to CD and sometimes glitzy bars where girls danced the night away trying to earn money. These were girls from small towns who had come from all across the country to try and earn a living and make money by uh, dancing the night away. And the government was shutting them down. There was no one to hear their pleas. I interviewed them, heard their stories. Watch them put on makeup and transform before my eyes from the harried, worried, mundane to the object of affection of many. And I remember um, I could not change the outcome of the government's decision, obviously, but I could definitely give the girls a platform to air their views. It was one of the most humbling experiences in my life to talk to those girls and they've given me life lessons in humility and hustle and drive. After that, all of these stories had still not prepared me for what was to come. Um, in 2005, I recall Mumbai witnessed the biggest cloudburst it had ever seen. So 944 milliliters of rain in a span of 24 hours. That was completely unheard of and it was non-stop. I was out with my cameraman reporting and got stuck like many others. So we waited for nearly four hours uh, through knee deep and sometimes chest deep waters to reach office. By then it was night. There was no going back home. There were no roads to go back to uh, until the waters receded. The next morning, those of us who were unlucky enough to be in the office were asked to go back out and report on what was going on. And once again, the only way to go anywhere was to walk. So my cameraman and I did just that. We waded again through the waterlogged streets. So many people had got stuck in their cars and had died. Others were walking through the night to get back home. It was horrendous. I had never seen anything like this. You know, the city that never sleeps had come to a complete standstill. Nearly 700 people died that day and thousands others were injured, I remember. And not to mention crores lost in property and assets. It was something that nobody had foreseen and nobody could do anything about it. Um, I reported for countless hours walking through the pouring rain back and forth, soaked to my bones and I was tired and numb. I will never forget that experience ever in my life and I hope we don't get to experience anything like that ever again. One day and it wreaked havoc completely over the city. You know, I thought things would have been done but there was still more to come. Soon after, there came a series of train blasts in Mumbai in uh, 2006. Uh, or 2007, I can't recall the date exactly. Uh, there were seven blasts in 11 minutes. I was one of the closest from my channel to one of the blast sites in Santa Cruz Railway Station. Um, I just had the presence of mind to call my parents and let them know that I was okay and to, um, you know, watch the news and not worry. Soon after, the cops jammed the mobile phone networks and as I walked through the tracks, I saw intermingled bits of the train with parts of people who were strewn around and it was the first time uh, I was seeing death at such close quarters. I tried to report as best as I could. The slum dwellers on either side of the tracks, I mean the slum dwellers who live on either side of the train tracks in Mumbai, wherever you go, there's clearly a space crunch. They were the first ones to come and help the injured and the dead even before the emergency services came. And I remember this young boy pulling my collar and threatening me as I was recording my piece because he was so angry. The scenes that I saw that day and the ensuing scenes in the hospital will forever be burned in my memory. I mean, it was humanity at its worst and also its best. You know, at this juncture, I felt I needed to set my sights higher on the next stage of my career. And I applied for a master's in international affairs at Columbia University and got admitted uh, to its master's program. I still remember holding the letter of admission in my hand. It was one of the proudest moments of my life. However, I could not raise the $100,000 that was required to pay for the two-year program. So I couldn't go. I deferred my admission by a year, hoping that I could raise the money. Um, it was at this juncture that my editor, Srinivasan Jain, is very popular, goes by the name of Vasu. Um, it was this, at this point, he gave me an assignment on cinema. Um, he gave me an assignment on Malayalam cinema by virtue of the fact that I was a Malayali. Now, I had no knowledge of cinema. 
much less regional cinema. And I, for the life of me, did not know how I was going to pull off this assignment because I didn't know anyone here barring the two big M's of Malayalam cinema. I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock if you're a Malayali and you didn't know these two legends, obviously. But a fellow journalist came to the rescue. She gave me the number of a young actor and said, try talking to him. Uh, he might be able to help you out uh, with whatever you want to do. That one phone call changed the course of my life. Uh, you see, my friend had given me an introduction to my future husband, Prithviraj Sukumaran. And um, in my defense, I never interviewed Prithviraj. So my integrity as a journalist is intact. Uh, friendship blossomed. And of course, eventually, we started dating. Um, it was at this point in time, I was trying to rustle up the funds to go to Colombia when I was spotted by a BBC journalist while out on assignment. And they asked me to come for an interview for a new business program uh, that they were setting up here in India. I interviewed for the job and once again, as I walked out of the room, I knew in my gut that I'd got the job. You know, I'd made it to the mecca of journalism. I'd got a job at the BBC. This is where I wanted to be. But there was a big catch. I had never reported on business affairs before and had no clue about the ups and downs of the economy or the stock markets. Personally, it was a very big challenge and I had to learn to swim from day one. In my time there as their India business correspondent, I reported on the booming India story, uh, its mega deals, interviewed top leaders of India Inc. and also reported on the India growth story and its growing uh, international significance. I also managed to cover the horrifying attacks yet again on Mumbai. I was in the London office at that point in time for a brief uh, training period. And I remember seeing this horror play out on live television, which I'm sure all of you remember. Soon after came the global economic recession and everything was impacted in its wake. Um, the whole world and the much touted India growth story completely went south. And after that, uh, I thought I'd give up my dreams of going to Colombia because I didn't want to take two years off from work. Um, at the same time, uh, I'm kind of glad I did because I would have come out smack bang in the middle of the world's biggest economic recession with a $100,000 loan and no job to boot. So my professional life was going great guns and at the same time, love was blossoming in my personal life. Um, you know, after dating for four years, Prithvi and I decided to make it official and tie the knot. I took six months off from work. Yeah, it's a luxury. I got six months off. Uh, I got uh, six months. I took six months off from work and we tied uh, the knot here in a very private ceremony. And after staying here for a few months, I went back to Bombay uh, to my job. But keeping up with an actor's life uh, was very tough. And uh, after thinking about things and mulling things over, I eventually decided to move to Kerala for good. Uh, for the first time in my life, I didn't have a plan or a goal and uh, that for me was very scary. Um, I traveled a lot with him and basically tried to wing it, but I must admit, I'm not good at winging it. I needed a plan. So I decided to go for a short course in management and got admission at IIM Bangalore for a management program for women entrepreneurs. That was in 2012. It was a very brief but knowledgeable course. And soon after, in 2014, I had my daughter, Alankrita, after which it took me a few years to wrap my head around motherhood. I think that was the toughest phase of my life because I just didn't know what to do. And, you know, it doesn't come with a manual. So you really can't study something in school and tell you that how to be a mother. So that was a bit of a struggle for me. By this time, I'd started taking an interest in cinema, but I still didn't know, you know, how to how it worked or the nuances behind it. My husband and I had been talking about setting up a production company of our own for some time and we decided to launch Prithviraj Productions in 2017. For my first project, I partnered with Sony Pictures International and made the film Nine, which was a sci-fi film and it was a studio's first foray uh, into regional cinema and I was really glad that they chose to partner with us. Nine basically taught me the ropes by plunging me into the project headlong. While it was easy for me to coordinate with a corporate giant like Sony and get the legal and financial paperwork all sorted, I had no clue on how to plan and execute the shoot in a place like Manali and Spiti. Whatever I learned, I learned on the job. And I remember we shot the film in the summer of 2018 and it remains one of my most cherished experiences to date, challenges notwithstanding. I remember at that time I learned that a producer is not just someone who signs the checks, but is also someone who's invested in the project from, 
you know, from start to finish, from finding the right script to casting the lead. In my case, the lead was at home, didn't have to go looking very far. And, uh, you know, to finding the right technicians, to planning the shoot, executing the shoot, looking after the project through the release, a producer has to stay committed no matter what. And all our hardships were forgotten when I saw the logo of Columbia TriStar gracing the screen on my very first production. Sadly, Nine didn't do as well as we expected it to. Um, it was a film ahead of its times, but it's a film that I'm very proud of bankrolling as a producer. Also, for a first timer, I made the film under budget, and that's something I'm super proud of. You know, you have to say that. You know, making a film under budget is no mean feat. That too for an international studio. Following um, year nine, we came out with Driving License, which was an entertainer, a commercial comedy drama. Um, Driving License um, came out in, I think, 2019. It was a film about two men and their fragile egos. Always works with the audience, trust me. It's a formula that we have perfected. So yeah, it did really well for us. Um, but the thing is, uh, there weren't too many examples and there still aren't too many examples for me to follow and learn from. There are hardly a handful of women in the business of production and the industry, as is evident, is largely male driven. So whatever mistakes I was making, I was making my own and the path ahead really had to be figured out. We were just getting started, I remember when the lockdown hit and life as you all knew it changed completely. After the initial shock, I remember we started reading scripts again and Prithvi and I came across Kurudi. Now, instantly we knew this would be our next. Kurudi is a sensitive socio-political thriller and we shot it just after the second lockdown with a minimal crew. That itself was an experience in itself to try, usually on a film set there are about 100, 150 odd people and to try and make a film with just 50 people was a challenge. Plus, uh, keeping all the COVID restrictions in mind, mind you, at that point in time, it was, you know, we just finished the second lockdown and Kerala was, you know, in the midst of its full wave. So we got the permissions and we managed to shoot this film during that time. It was a film that premiered for us for the first time on a streaming service and it was our first direct to digital film. Now, by this time, I was always obviously trained to talk to corporates and I'd started doing deals with them. I started handling the digital sales of our films, which is one of the prime revenue sources of cinema today. Kurdi for us was a very big hit and talking to these corporates taught me the art of negotiation and also the not so subtle art of salesmanship. So I think that was a win-win um, for me. Soon after, we followed suit with J uh, Janaganamana and Kadwa, both of which we released in theatres this year. And both combined together garnered a rep box office revenue of 100 crores plus worldwide. Now, as a producer and as one of the few female producers in the business, this is a feat that I'm absolutely proud of. Not too, uh, too many men or women here can stake claim to this, uh, at least in Kerala. And it's a feat that we are absolutely proud of. Uh, but soon after, uh, what we tried to do was uh, we got in and started distributing films like 83, KGF2, uh, Charlie 777. We also wanted to expand our footprint across India. And I've just finished filming our first Hindi film starring Akshay Kumar and co-produced with Karan Johar uh, of Dharma Productions. So that's definitely something to look forward to. The film is releasing next year. And on the domestic front, I have gold lined up for release. And um, Gold is starring Prithviraj um, and Nantara, and I really hope that if it comes out this year, it all depends on the director, I can score a hat-trick at the box office. So, yeah. <laughs> so, in continuously interacting uh, with uh, content creators from Malayalam and talking to writers and directors from Bombay and other places, I realized that good cinema should be at the heart of production and nothing else. You know, we have to remember why we got into the business in the first place. Cinema has the ability to change minds, to move hearts, to influence people. And it's important to make sure that we keep that in mind when we are making a film. So while keeping good content front and center, I'd like to leave my own mark at the profession. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to do less star-driven films, more women-centric films, um, discover and introduce new talent and bring in a lot more women into this profession. That's what we are lacking here. In my growth, um, I've realized that without a proper support group and a conducive support structure, one can't really go very far. With my journey, I've realized that, you know, the, the fact that there are no women in this business, that is constantly reinforced. So let's change that. How do I plan on changing that? Um, I'm here, I'm available, I'm here for you to reach out and talk to. That's what I can do. And with 
the existing support structures and groups, let's continue to grow and make more opportunities available for women. Cinema is a big industry and it has a lot of opportunities. Let's make those opportunities accessible to us women. That is my goal. You know, I want to create an environment that would garner support for all to grow. So this is my story. We are all a sum total of our stories and I'm glad that you took out the time to listen to me so patiently and invited me here. Thank you, Tai Kerala and the Women Entrepreneur Network. And I really hope that you all get to write your own stories in the manner that you see best. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supriya, for that. It was just absolutely wonderful and feel inspired to know that sometimes when you're roads change, it changes for the better. Of course, when you're young and you make that phone call, be sure who you're making it to, right? <laughs> All right. I'd now like to call upon Nisha Jose, social enabler, author, responsible diver, and envir environmentalist, heartlisted on doing her solo expedition, kayaking and rowing in one river in each state of India. She has th three more states and three more union territories left to cover, and she will be handing over a token of appreciation to the wonderful Supriya Menon.